Sponsored by Audible. Hello, my beautiful watchers. Well, the people have spoken. While I'm avoiding directly talking about movies in support of the writers and actors' strike, it appears that I'm once again crawling back into the bittersweet embrace of Stephanie Meyer's Twilight franchise. Legit though, thank you for loving me enough not to vote for an E.L. James book. Life and Death Twilight Reimagined was published in October 2015 and was Meyer's sixth edition to the Twiverse. All I knew about this book going in was that it was a gender-changed version of the first Twilight book and, uh, yeah. That sure is what this was. I'm not entirely sure what I was expecting, but apparently on some subconscious level, I was assuming it would involve more than just a literally Twilight again with slightly different names and pronouns because I felt genuine surprise when it turned out to be exactly that. Stephanie Meyer booted up her Twilight manuscript, clicked Control H, replaced Belle with Beau, Edward with Ethel, called it a day, and presumably made a couple of million dollars. I don't know, I guess I just I just thought that because the word reimagined was in the title, there might have been some shred of imagination applied to the story, but more fool done. This is definitely not the Twilight equivalent of Marvel's What If, you know, a, a thought experiment to explore what might have happened differently in different circumstances. It is just Twilight again, I cannot stress this enough. 90% of this book is word for freaking word. Like, <sighs> Gender is a frustratingly complicated construct that I do not have the time, patience, or wits to explore right now, but am I completely nuts for thinking that? It is utterly ludicrous to assume that a complex series of events would play out exactly the same in a parallel universe where everyone is a different gender. Maya is really saying that a cis teen boy who's been socialized as a cis teen boy since birth would go through a book's worth of story making all the same decisions and having the exact same thought processes as a cis teen girl. Actually, saying everyone is a different gender is not technically true. There is one character who directly features in this book who maintained their original gender, and that is Charlie. Yeah, Charlie. Like, everyone but Charlie. Even Billy became Bonnie, but Charlie stands alone with his original chromosomes. Meyer addresses this in the foreword, citing the unlikelihood of a father getting sole custody of a baby in the 80s. This reminded me of all the excuses she made for why there couldn't be a battle between the Cullens and the Volturi at the end of Breaking Dawn. She has this weird tendency to act as if certain parts of her world are out of her hands, like she's writing non-fiction. If something seems inevitable, then there's just nothing she can do to change it. Your world's got vampires and shapeshifters in it, Maya. Do you really think divorce proceedings are the cornerstone on which the audience's suspension of disbelief would crumble? Even if that was true, there's still a bunch of very easy explanations for how Bo's father might have ended up with the kid. For example, Charlena, or whatever stupid name she would have given her, could have not contested custody. You can even make that a little point of awkwardness between mother and son. It's just bizarrely inconsistent when Maya thinks a plot hole is completely insurmountable, and when she breezes past them with nary a second glance. I also want to take a quick moment to acknowledge how hilarious the name changes are. Maya chose the theme of finding the most similar sounding name possible for each person, and stuck to it super hard, no matter how stupid that similar sounding name ended up being. Anyways, this is not an episode of Lost in Adaptation, but the format might actually be quite useful to fully get across how little creativity went into this reimagining. So, fuck it, let's do this. 17-year-old Beaufort Swan comes to live in Forks, a small town in Washington state, to live with his police chief father after his mother remarries and starts moving around a lot to accommodate her new husband's sports career. To his surprise, he is instantly popular in his new school and the object of obsession for every horny lass his age. The one exception to this being Edith Cullen, a freakishly pale but beautiful young girl who's seated next to him in class. She seems agitated and even a little enraged by his very existence one day, then attempts to be friendly the next before returning to open hostility again. Bo begins to suspect there's something a tad dodgy about her when she appears to display superhuman speed and strength to save him from a potentially fatal automobile accident. She then crosses paths with Julie Black, who lives on the nearby reservation and who tells him that there's a ridiculous myth amongst her people about a group of immortal vampires that live in the area and were at odds with her shape-shifting ancestors. With this in mind, he researches vampire lore and notices some similarities between it and the behavior of his sexy saviour. Shortly later, Edith saves him once again, this time from being assaulted on the street, and they hash out the whole being a vampire thing. 
It turns out her entire family are creatures of darkness, but they confine themselves to only drinking from animals for ethical reasons. Also, she can telepathically read everyone's mind except for his. She explains that she's been behaving the way she has and become so obsessed with Bo because the smell of his blood is ridiculously appealing to her, comparing it to the pull a recovering addict feels towards heroin. Edith admits that she came within inches of feeding on him the day they met, and she's worried that she might snap and kill him at any moment. So, Bo would be significantly safer if they stayed away from each other. However, she no longer has the willpower to enforce that and agrees to date him if he's willing to accept the ever-present danger of being horribly murdered and fed on if her self-control falters for even a second. Bo immediately agrees because he's already so in love with her, the possibility of a grisly end doesn't faze him one bit. Things seem to go quite well for a little while. Despite being nervous about showing him what she looks like in direct sunlight, Bo is quite into the skin made of crushed diamond effect it has on her, and he's also flattered to discover that Edith has been following him everywhere without him knowing and listening in on his conversations using her vampire super hearing and mind reading. He's a little upset to find out that she's been breaking into his house to watch him sleep, but only because he's apparently a sleep talker and is worried that he said something embarrassing. During a super-powered baseball game, the Cullens accidentally attract the attention of three vampires who just happen to be passing through the area, and one of them apparently gets her jollies from hunting very difficult prey. Unfortunately, Edith's super-obvious protectiveness over Bo makes him her new target. In a desperate attempt to keep him safe, the Cullens take him far away, but said evil vampire tricks him into ditching them and coming to her by pretending to take his mother hostage. Edith and her family are forced to battle her to the death, while Bo slowly suffers on the ground as vampire venom seeps through his body. Unfortunately, Maya did not take this opportunity to reduce the unnecessary over-descriptions of everything. The book still drags every time she tries to build tension by describing cereal. So little of Bo's internal thoughts are changed from Bella's. If you've read Twilight multiple times, which unfortunately I have, it's sometimes really hard to remember he's not Bella. Which actually improved the experience for me, because when I forgot and pictured her, it turned the story into an LGBTQ romance. One of the things I was excited to discover when I started this book was, if Bo and Edith were going to recreate the piggyback mountain climb, and to my delight, yes, Yes, they did. In one of the rare moments of Maya actually updating the story, Bo feels pretty silly because he is taller than Edith and his legs stick out super far in front of them. And now, a quick word about this video's sponsor. So, as I'm sure you guys are already aware, I'm a really cool guy with lots of hobbies and places to be. I'm out in the garage making swords, I'm working out, I'm driving to do more cool guy stuff in other places, and during all this, am I just listening to the Elizabethan-era ghost who follows me around talking about the Queen's secret fetishes? Heck no! I'm listening to Audible. And do you know what's really cool about Audible? Their online library of audiobooks is so massive, if there's a time title that, shall we say, did not live up to expectations, there's literally thousands of other options. Has the impending change in Geralt put you off The Witcher? It doesn't matter, the original stories are way better, and the complete series is on Audible. Have you struggled to get through the Lords of the Rings trilogy? Listen to it being read by Andy Serkis. I will give you one guess which character he's best at. Speaking of awesome narrators, I've got an episode about the insanity that is the last battle coming up, Justice for Susan, and it's going to be narrated to me by Space Daddy himself, Sir Patrick Stewart. All you have to do to get started is go to www.audible.com noble, or text noble to 500 500. For the tempted but cautious, you can get a no-strings-attached free membership for a month that comes with a credit that can be exchanged for a title of your choice, and said title will remain yours forever. And you'll get a new credit every month, so the sky's the limit with Audible's ever-growing selection of audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts. So again, that is www.audible.com slash noble, or text noble to 500-500. Okay, so there is one singular, solitary, standalone significant change to the story, and that change, my beautiful watchers, is the ending. Unlike Bella, it is too late for Bo by the time the Cullens come to his rescue, as the vampire poison has spread too far into his body. Edith, apparently lacking Edward's all-encompassing desire to keep his beloved from becoming a vampire, offers Bo a choice. She can speed his demise, or she can speed his transformation. Bo selects the latter, so Edith bites him on his neck. Even with this extra juice, though, it still takes an agonizing few days for him to fully die and become a vampire. Now a full member of the Cullen clan, the family fakes Bo 
Bo's death by burning his truck with an exhumed corpse inside. Bo watches his own funeral from afar, convinced by the Cullens that he can never see his family again for their own safety. The plan is apparently for him to wait out the Cullens' graduation in hiding so they can move to a different state without it looking sus. However, during this time, Sam and Jacob turn up in wolf form looking to rumble with the Cullens for killing a human, but are talked into trying a peaceful meeting first, and the Cullens manage to convince Bonnie that Bo's transformation wasn't their doing and they intend to depart the area soon. The book ends on Bo and Edith getting engaged and looking forward to eternity together. My first reaction to this was, goodness gracious, this is a pretty fucking dark ending for Charlie and Renee as they're both going to spend the rest of their lives believing they inadvertently killed their son with their actions. Keep in mind the last thing that Bo said to his dad was pretending he hated being trapped in forks with him so much he had to leave immediately. I'm pretty sure that this change is the result of Maya wishing to make it clear that this is a standalone book, as it makes doing the same lazy conversion to any of these subsequent novels impossible. Besides this, there are just a few minor changes that I consider worthy of note dotted around. Another thing I went into this book curious about was how they were going to handle the part where Edward saves Bella from a street gang who were planning to sexually assault her because, well, Let's face it, that's a very male-on-female crime. Maya clearly thinks so because she worked in a setup for this event into the early parts of the book. When Bo first arrived in Forks, he accidentally bumped into a guy and only escaped having his ass whooped because Charlie was there in his police uniform. Later, when he's in Seattle, Bo walks past an alleyway and glances over to see this guy and his gang doing crime. And they decide he must be an undercover cop for some reason and plan to murder him before Edith shows up. It is depressing that it takes this much convoluted groundwork to justify a guy facing the same level of danger a woman deals with simply by existing. Oh, interesting note, Edith has to be talked out of going back to mess the thugs up, which is something that film Edward required, but not book Edward. In a change I actually quite liked, they set up a little bromance between Bo and Archie, formerly Alice, as he explains that, because of his future vision, he's known that he and Bo are going to be best friends for a while now, and has just been waiting for him to show up in his life. Like film Bella, Bo takes a much more hands-on approach to setting up his friends after he declines their advances, putting on a theatrical performance in the cafeteria, pretending that he was furious, and the reason that he had said no was because he knew they were in love with each other. Okay. Do you know how I know without a shadow of a doubt that Stephanie Meyer doesn't understand teen boys on a fundamental level? Not once does Bo fantasize about having sex with the gorgeous girl he's spending time with. I am sorry to be crude, but unlike Meyer, I have been a male 17 year old allosexual virgin, so I can say with absolute authority that we were always thinking about sex. If there is anything that I am 100% sure about in this world of ours, it's that Bo would have been picturing Edith naked two seconds after meeting her. His internal thoughts only mention her boobs once in chapter 12, and even then, he refers to them as the gentle swell of her breasts. I've talked before about how Stephanie Meyer is the perfect inverse of men writing women. Edith was consistently more openly sexual than Bo throughout this book. Oh, but maybe he's a hopeless romantic. You can do both. You can do both. You can picture your wedding day with someone and them. It's not contradictory. So, what does Maya think that young men obsess over when they're attracted to a woman? Well, this question leads me into a recurring difference between Twilight and Life and Death, because there is a significant downgrade in how verbose the leads are when they're internally gushing about their partner's good looks. As tiresome as I found it that she barely ever thought about anything else, Bella at least had a range of things that she liked about Edward's face. His alabaster brow, his jawline, his cheekbones, his marble skin. Bo is focused on exactly one thing, and it comes up over and over and over and over and over and over again throughout. I'm just imagining Maya sitting down to write this book and thinking to herself, Hmm, what's something that would drive a teen boy just absolutely wild? What is the most important thing in the entire world to a heterosexual male? <gasps> dimples! Men love dimples. 
I looked up to see her smiling a dimpled smile so perfect that I could only stare at her like a fool. Have I heard of him? She asked, smiling in response, just enough for a hint of the dimples to show. She shook her head and smiled with half her mouth so that one dimple popped out. Nod, she said, her lips curled up into a smile, her dimples flashing. Her amused expression was back, the hint of dimples threatening on her cheeks. Her dimples flashed as soon as she knew I'd seen her. She flashed her dimples at me, which took away some of the sting of being called incompetent. She leaned on the frame and threw her dimples at them. Jeremy's mouth fell open. Thanks, she said, dimpling again. I'll give Bo a ride home. Two cokes, she told him, and almost like an experiment, she smiled a wide, dimpled smile right into his face. See you at lunch, she said, brandishing the dimples. She smiled a slow smile. It started small, but ended with a full array of dimples. She displayed the dimples. You'll find out tomorrow. She flourished her dimples, and my chest did its mini heart attack thing. She was lying across my bed, hands behind her head, ankles crossed, a huge, dimpled smile smile on her face. You look, she suddenly dimpled up, delicious. Thanks, Charlie. She unleashed the dimples and his face went blank. BT dubs Charlie being made stupid by the good looks of his teenage son's teenage girlfriend is a bit of a yikes moment. She flashed her dimples, leaving me breathless. She smiled, slowly at first, but then suddenly her smile was huge and dimpled. She dimpled. You nailed it, Maya. When men envision the perfect woman, the very first thing we think about is always dimples. Final thoughts. So, I have to ask, who is this book for? I mean, was it supposed to bring in a male audience? Because it is not the fantasy of the average young man to be protected by a radically more powerful woman. We are far too insecure for that. From what I've gathered from asking Twilight fans, even within said fandom, reactions to this book were an almost perfect three-way split between disliked it, loved it, and had just, like, extremely mixed feelings about it. Having to go through the entirety of something virtually identical all over again just to get an alternate ending did not work for Clue, and I don't think it worked here. I don't know, it just, it gets to me that Maya clearly did not have another story to tell here. There was no creative reason for this to exist. She claims that her primary motivation was to prove that Twilight isn't sexist by showing that the story works just as well with the genders changed around and a male human displaying as much agency as a paper towel in a hurricane when surrounded by creatures overwhelmingly more powerful than him. I can't speak for everyone, but I personally feel like the lack of effort that she put into updating the story kind of negates this point. Bo doesn't feel like a guy, or even a person. He feels like Bella in a fake mustache, so the question of if it seems natural that he's as helpless as she was when ill-driven vans, thugs, and vampires are trying to kill him is just drowned out in the sheer absurdity of it all. What changes there were came back to bite her too, as she clearly feels more comfortable allowing her vampire to be more openly sexual when it's only a young man's chastity in danger of corruption. So I'm not calling Maya a liar, I am sure that this point that she utterly failed to make was a factor in her motivation for this book, but I can't help but assume that another motivator was it was an incredibly easy way to make a truckload of money for very, very little effort. And if I'm being 100% honest with you guys, I kind of respect the hustle, which is the closest I've ever come to respecting Stephanie Meyer. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, or my channel will die, and I'll have to get a job bartending a British pub in LA and spend my days trying to convince customers that I'm not faking the accent. Take care. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz, April Mack, and Curtis Charles Jr. Shout out to Il Nej for the credits music, check out his channel for more parody and original songs, and a huge thank you to this video's editor, Sophia Ricciardi, links to her work in the video description. Maya Cho chose, chose, chose. I keep wanting to call Edith Ethel, and I'm wondering if I've done that and not noticed before now, but well, that's for my editor to worry about. Sorry, Sophia. <laughs> staring directly into the ground light. You're gonna go blind. Little voidling. Let's make a boy.